Welcome to the next part of the exploit development series. In this part, we are going to bypass the first stack protection called Data Execution Prevention, or short DAP, which prevents us from executing code that we placed on the stack, for example by exploiting a buffer overflow. To get started, we installed the SyncBreeze Enterprise application and then head to Services to start the SyncBreeze service. After doing so, we can head to WinDebug, attach the process, and then load the gnarly extension to check which modules are protected with ASLR. This is important because we are about to write a ROP chain consisting out of ROP gadgets, and the addresses of those gadgets must remain the same so that our exploit works reliably. Right here we see SyncBreeze, the application itself, LibPol, LibSync, and LibSPP. We can't use SyncBreeze, LibPol, and LibSync because all of them start with a null byte. LibSPP, on the other hand, does not, so we are going to extract our ROP gadgets from that DLL. To do so, we are going to use RP++. Simply select the file you want to extract the gadgets from, in this case LibSPP, and the maximum amount of instructions each gadget may have. I usually set this to 5, and to store the output in a file, we can redirect it into a text file named for example, rob.txt. This process might take a few seconds, depending on the size of the module we selected. After RP++ has finished, we can move to the desktop and see that we've got a rob.txt file, which we can open with, for example, Sublime Text or Visual Studio Code. It doesn't really matter which text editor you're using, though I would recommend choosing one that supports regex patterns when searching for instructions. This is especially useful since ROP chains aren't straightforward, but more like a Rubik's cube, so you often have to come up with alternatives or little tricks to achieve the desired outcome. When searching with Visual Studio Code, we have this little button up here which says use regular expressions. This is what you want to use most of the time when looking for gadgets. Since writing a ROP chain can take quite some time, I already prepared one for this video, so feel free to write your own one after finishing this part of the exploit development series to gain some additional practice. And also please check out my corresponding article on guided hacking for a more detailed explanation. Before moving on, we still have to do two things. We are going to use the Windows API function virtualalloc to bypass step, which will change the memory protection for the memory region our shellcode is located in. To write a ROP chain, we should take a look at the prototype of virtual alloc, which shows that we have one optional function argument and three mandatory ones. LP address, even though it's optional, is still required in our scenario because it must be set to the shellcode's address. The return address will also be the same, since after the function call has finished, we want to return to our shellcode. EW size can simply be set to one, as most shellcodes will fit into one memory page and virtual alloc operates on a per memory page basis. FL allocation type must be set to hex 1000 for a mem commit, and FL protect must be set to hex 40 for execute read write. Now that we know the function prototype, we can build a ROP skeleton for it and the ROP chain itself, though we still have one thing left to do before moving on. Since we don't want to hardcode the address of virtual alloc from kernel 32, as kernel 32 is protected with ASLR, we have to check the import address table of libspp. For that, we open up IDA, load libspp, and navigate to the imports tab. Right here, we can use the quick filter option to look for a virtual alloc, though unfortunately virtual alloc does not get imported by libspp. Depending on the scenario, there are some alternatives. In this case, we are going to write an operating system dependent exploit, meaning we will simply take another function from kernel 32 that gets imported, you reference it to obtain the actual address instead of the IAT address, and then add the difference between that function and virtual alloc to essentially obtain the address of virtual alloc. Those differences or offsets will change with Windows updates or even patches, so there is a fair chance that the value I'm using won't work for you. For this video, I'll take get last error, and now that we have the prototype and an address from the IAT, we can move on to our Linux machine and start assembling our exploit. Right here I prepared the skeleton for our proof of concept exploit, which will use a buffer of 780 characters and an additional 4 characters for the return address overwrite to craft the malicious web request, which then exploits the SyncBreeze application. To get started, we first need the ROP skeleton for a virtual alloc. 
Those skeletons usually look pretty much the same, the only difference being the function arguments. In the skeleton, you can see the placeholder for the virtual alloc address, the return address for LP address, which will be the same as the return address, EW size, FL allocation type, and FL protect. Since we are going to place the skeleton between our buffer and the return address override, we have to adjust the length of our buffer accordingly. Afterwards, we can proceed with writing our ROP chain. And as I said, it's a bit like a Rubik's Cube, so if you don't understand it right away, please check out my post on guided hacking and just practice it over and over again and write your own ROP chains until it clicks for you. First, we want to preserve the current stack pointer by storing it in another CPU register. For that, I'm overriding the return address with a ROP gadget that will push ESP and then pop it into ESI, essentially saving the stack pointer in the ESI register. As you can see, in between we have an increment ECX and an ADC, EAX and some hex value instructions. As long as those unwanted instructions don't break our execution flow or mangle up the stack too much, it doesn't really matter. Afterwards, we have to add 4 bytes, simply because there are 4 bytes of space between the return address and stack pointer. To line up the pointer we saved with our dummy virtual alloc address, we first move ESI into EAX and then pop minus 20 into EBP. Adding EBP to EAX will then line up EAX with our dummy virtual alloc address and the exchange EAX ECX instruction will swap those two registers, storing the pointer in ECX. Since EAX is used for arithmetic operations most of the time, you don't want to store data in this register for a longer period of time. Next, now that we have aligned our pointer, we want to obtain the address for virtual alloc. First, we pop the address of get last error that we obtained from the import address table into EAX and then dereference it using a move EAX dereferenced EAX instruction. This will essentially move the actual address of get last error from kernel32 instead of the IAT address into EAX. Afterwards, I'm popping the difference between get last error and virtual alloc into EBP and use sub EAX EBP to align EAX with virtual alloc. Then we just have to add a bunch of characters for stack alignment because of the pop ESI, pop EBP, and pop EBX instructions. Since ECX is lined up with our ROP skeleton, we use a move dereferenced ECX EAX instruction to patch the address of virtual alloc into the ROP skeleton. Usually, it's a pretty good idea to reuse the gadgets we already have in order to save time. For example, the move dereferenced ECX EAX instruction will from now on be used for every address and argument that we have to patch into the skeleton. Next, we have to patch the return address where we want to return to after the API function call has finished. And for that, I'm moving the current pointer from ECX into EAX and pop a random offset into EBP. I already know the correct offset, which you can't know while writing the ROP chain, as the offset will change during this process meaning you just place in a dummy value and then patch the correct value at the very end. Try to figure out how to do this on your own, and if you're stuck, feel free to check out my article on guided hacking for the solution. So basically, it's just one breakpoint and some basic calculations. After popping that value into EBP, I'm reusing a gadget, the sub EAX EBP instruction, to align EAX with the address of where my shellcode is going to be placed later on. Again, we need some stack alignment and then we increment ECX four times so that the pointer points to the dummy return address instead of the virtual alloc address in the skeleton. Then again, reusing a gadget to patch the return address into the ROP skeleton. Since the return address and LP address are the same, we can just increment ECX four times again and patch the same address into the ROP skeleton. Next on, we have the DW size parameter. Right here, we increment ECX again four times, X or EAX with itself, making it effectively zero, and then increment it, making it one. As I said earlier, one memory page is enough for most shellcodes, so EAX being set to one is perfectly fine, and then we reuse the move gadget once again to patch the argument into the skeleton. First, we have the FL allocation type, which must be set to hex 1000. 
since hex 1000 and negative hex 1000 both contain a null byte, we pop negative hex 1001 into EAX, then negate it to make it positive hex 1001, and decrement it to, well, subtract 1 and make it hex 1000. As usual, we increment ECX four times and patch the Apple allocation type argument into our skeleton. For the next argument, we can reuse this technique to patch the Apple protect argument. Simply pop the negative value of hex 40 into EAX, use negate to make it positive, increment ECX four times to align the pointer, and then patch it into the skeleton. Finally, all we have to do is move the execution flow to our virtual alloc call and create some shellcode to, for example, obtain a reverse shell. To align the pointer, we first move ECX, which holds the pointer, into EAX and pop minus decimal 14 into EBP, which will make the pointer point to the virtual alloc address inside the ROB skeleton. Simply add EBP to EAX to line it up, and then exchange EAX and ESP to put the EAX register into the ESP register, resulting in the execution flow getting moved to our ROB skeleton after the return instruction. All that is left to do now is writing some shellcode or creating it, for example using msfvenom, and putting everything together in our payload variable. I'm using a shellcode that will spawn our reverse shell on port 443, and to put everything together, we simply say that the payload will be the buffer, the ROB skeleton, the return address override, which is basically just part of the ROB chain, the ROB chain, which will make the call to virtual alloc to bypass step, and then our shellcode to obtain a reverse shell. Before executing our exploit, we head back to Windows, go to WinDebug, and resume the execution flow of SyncBreeze. Then we can open up a terminal and start a listener on port 443. And finally, we can execute the Python script, which will result in a reverse shell on my Windows virtual machine. As I said, the concepts of dep and rob might take some time to understand. And once again, the most important factor is just practice. You have to know assembly and how to achieve the same outcome with different instructions, since you are limited to the already existing ones, and then it's just practice, 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 and sooner or later writing ROB chains will be pretty easy as long as you have more or less decent ROB gadgets available to you. Till then, I hope to catch you again in the next video of my exploit development series.